Hello, and welcome to the Market Bull Podcast. Please note, topics and stocks discussed in this podcast are not financial or investment advice. On today's episode, I spoke with Kobe Hannock, the CEO of WeBit Nano. WeBit Nano is a listed company on the Australian Stock Exchange under code WBT and is in the semiconductor sector. Kobe first talked about how his journey began with the company. He then went on to explain what semiconductors are and where they are used in everyday life. We talked about the geopolitical tensions arising within this sector and what it means for demand and supply. Kobe broke down what resistive random access memory, RERAM is, and how the product is developed, licensed, and manufactured with strategic partnerships. I know if that sounds confusing, don't worry, we'll explain it all throughout the episode. Semiconductors are everywhere in this world, and this is a great introduction into their applications. I hope you enjoy listening. So hello and welcome to the Market Bull Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Kostrich, and I'm very excited today. I have the CEO of WeBit Nano, Kobe Hanuk, joining me today. Welcome to the show, Kobe. Hi, Ben. Thanks for having me here. Um, and for those, I mean, I've been following the WeBit Nano story for a while, and it's it's really a fascinating rise in, in success, but I know I've heard you talking a few other things that it wasn't always that case. Before we dive into the whole WeBit Nano and the technology, how did you get involved in, in WeBit Nano and your initial involvement as an entrepreneur and businessman? So uh, I actually got into semiconductors by mistake, you could say. When I, when I went to the university, I was actually thinking of learning physics. Mm. And uh, a friend of my dad said, well, you know, if you, you want him to visit me at the unemployment agency uh, often, you know, he can learn physics, but he should think of something that's growing. And at the time, semiconductors was relatively new. Uh, and I had a friend who kind of came to me and said, you really need to go into this space, semiconductor software, et cetera. So that's how I, I started way back, uh, you know, very long time ago. Um, and I, uh, I started in, in the university, I actually got a university job in national semiconductor. And that's how I started being pulled into the semiconductor space. Uh, fast forward, uh, what, 40 years now, 40 something years. Uh, I went through several uh, startups. I, I liked uh, the startup, the smaller company atmosphere, very uh, energetic, very exciting, no, uh, much less politics and stuff. So I built my career on uh, helping startups uh, and, and build their business. I mean, I was an engineer for 15 years before I moved to the business side. And then uh, a bit, I've been helping startups on the business side. Since then, I've been involved in a couple of exits. Uh, and then, uh, what was it, six years ago, my next door neighbor came to me and said, I, I'm on the board of WeBit and I need to move to another place because I'm changing uh, uh, funds that I'm working at. And I recommended they take you to the board. And uh, I went to meet Daddy. And then very quickly after that, the, the previous CEO said he really needs to step down because of personal issues. And here I am. Farah, and the, the whole semiconductor space, how would you describe that for people? And, and where do you apply in, in everyday life? Because I've been, yeah, as I said, following it for a while, but I don't think people quite understand how important they are and how much they're involved in everyday life. Well, semiconductors are, you know, they're really everywhere. They're, they're, you know, anything you look at, you know, the the headset that the headphones that you have right now on your head, you know, that's semiconductors. The computer we're talking on, the cameras, everything is semiconductors. Your refrigerator, your washing machine. I think people recently realized they wanted to buy a refrigerator and they couldn't get it because it didn't have chips in it. So. Uh, you know, the average car just a few years ago had maybe several tens of, of processors in it. Now it's close to a thousand. I mean, you know, you, you reach your hand and you grab the handle and there's a sensors there that unlocks the car automatically. You have all these sensors around the car that sense uh, what's happening around it, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, the adaptive cruise control, I'm not even talking about autonomous vehicles, et cetera. Mm, yeah. So, they're everywhere. It's very strategic today. I mean, at the government, at the country level, most countries consider semiconductors as one of the most strategic things for them. You just look at all of these huge investments going on 
hundreds of billions of dollars going into semiconductors in, in so many countries. Um, I mean, the whole geopolitical tension between the U.S. and China is around semiconductors. It's about the fact that Taiwan has the largest uh, manufacturing facilities for semiconductors, and that's the big concern. Yeah. So it's really everywhere. You you just don't even understand just how much you're dependent on semiconductors. But if semi, by the way, maybe the best example is uh, you look back ten years ago with the top ten market cap companies in the world. I believe just one of them was a semiconductor company. Today, at least nine out of ten are either semiconductor companies or or totally dependent on semiconductors. So I think that just shows you where we stand. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the the geopolitical issue with, with semiconductors, because I know that's one thing that I followed in particular with the, the US-China tension. It's all surrounding that Taiwan area because of the semiconductors and the manufacturing that goes on there, which in, in a weird sense, it opens up opportunities for, for groups like Webit Nano to sort of come in and show the, their potential and their ability to manufacture chips. And, and I know um, Webit Nano just recently eclipsed the 1 billion market cap. And I know you've probably been told that quite a lot of times. Um, and I think that's a real inclination as to where it's going. But when you're looking at these geopolitical issues in particular, what's opportunities that, that open up for Webit Nano in particular? So it's important to understand manufacturing semiconductors is extremely delicate. It's very, very difficult. The, the facilities where you manufacture them are called fabs. Fabs need to be 100,000 times cleaner than where you do open heart surgery. I hope you understand that. Okay. Yeah, that's you know, one quite speck of think. dust and, 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 you know, oh my God. So these facilities cost billions of dollars to set up, even the simpler ones. You know, the, the more advanced ones are tens of billions of dollars to set up. So, uh, you know, WeBit will definitely not have such a facility of its own. Actually, Apple, Google, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, they don't have their own facilities. It's just way too expensive. Yeah. So, you know, everyone manufactures at what's called foundries which not everyone, Intel and Samsung have their own facilities, uh, but uh, in general, practically everyone is manufacturing at foundries, which have fabs that are open to the public. Now, the big fabs today in the world, or the big foundries are actually in Taiwan. And that's where all of this geopolitical tension comes in because, you know, if or when, and I won't go into, uh, into all of that, but uh, if China takes over there, um, the world as we know it comes to a grinding halt and, and it's going to be very, very, uh, very difficult. So that's why there's this whole issue now. Um, in terms of WeBit, uh, we have this opportunity because a lot of uh, companies are trying to start manufacturing outside Taiwan. To, you know, it's a risk management issue. Uh, a lot of new fabs are being set up now in the U.S. and, and other places. And for the moment, Webit has uh, focused on these uh, you know, U.S., European, Japanese, Korean companies. And less, uh, we, we, you know, we, we stopped really working with China right now. We, uh, we used to have a big focus on China now. It's not that we don't do anything in China, but basically China is on hold for us. Yeah. And it is, it's one of those sorts of balancing acts. And I think it's been highlighted in particularly more recently with everything that's going on in the world, companies and, and people and, and governments are trying to not relying so much on, on one or two particular countries to supply all their demand for, for certain products. And it's sort of trying to pick and match where you get your, your semiconductor chips or, or wherever it is. And I look to semiconductors as to, to illustrate how well an economy is going based on, on their trajectory, because they are, they're used in, in everything. And I think one of the interesting points that I was researching about Webit Nano was the actual technology itself and, and it's sort of benefits compared to traditional processing. So can you elaborate in a bit more about the Webit um, re-ram technology and its difference, or I guess how, how it's different to flash? Yeah. So, so first of all, let's clarify what exactly the technology is. You know, Weepit is developing a memory technology. Uh, again, just to help people understand, 
the demand for memory is skyrocketing right now. Uh, you just think of all the Instagram and TikTok movies and then think of all the surveillance cameras that are constantly recording things and then think of, you know, the, the term big data, you know, all of the AI and, and so on. They're accumulating insane amounts of data. All of that needs to be stored somewhere. Obviously, that's memory. Uh, in the memory space, there are two types of memory. There's the volatile and the non-volatile. Non-volatile being the memory that doesn't lose its data, even when you unplug it from power. Uh, think of your USB stick as uh, the best example of that. So we are focused on the non-volatile market. Now, in this market, the you know the, by far the the most popular technology is called Flash. And Flash uh, has been there for, for ages now. It's, uh, and, and it's been hitting more and more limits, the, the way that it works, et cetera. It's um, uh, it, it, one of the key challenges of Flash is, and, and you might have heard of Moore's Law or you know, the fact that everything in semiconductors constantly shrinks. You know, we can put so much more on a single piece of silicon uh, today than we could just a few years ago, and that's constantly shrinking. So the way that it's shrinking because we're managing to manufacture the basic elements in much smaller geometries. And, and so the, the industry, and, and I won't go into the technical details of it, but the industry has been going down from 180 to 130 to 90, 65, et cetera, nanometers. Uh, today, 22 is very popular and going down to the teens and even seven, five, and the most advanced designs today are already on three nanometer. Um, now, Flash got stuck at 40 nanometers. Uh, technically, you can't really shrink it below there. So all of these new applications, uh, AI, automotive, et cetera, that are going down to these very small geometries, they want to have a uh, rerun now, you know, because everything is shrinking, they can put a full system on a single chip, what we call a system on a chip. And, you know, that includes processors and communication and sensors and all the other stuff, but it has to include memory. Because Flash can't shrink, they can't actually embed Flash into these chips and they need to have the memory on a separate chip which is a huge issue. First of all, it has an impact in terms of power and speed, et cetera, but if there's a security leak, you can eavesdrop to the, on, to the communication there. So WeBits RERAM can shrink to the smallest geometry. At this point, we don't see a limit. Uh, we're already working. We announced that we have uh, uh, sent to manufacture uh, 22 nanometers and that uh, we're working on smaller geometries already. Um, so that's a big advantage that we have. We have a lot of other advantages. We're, we're much faster, much lower power, uh, radiation tolerant, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the key advantage that we really should focus on is the mere fact that it's just much easier and cheaper to manufacture than flesh. And at the end of the day, uh, that always makes the difference. You know, money becomes the number one uh, criteria. So our rear end adds about uh, five to seven percent to the cost of a silicon wafer. Uh, you look at flash, that adds about ten to uh, twenty percent to a uh, cost of a silicon wafer. You know, some other types of memory that we might talk about later uh, go even to thirty, forty, and even fifty percent added cost. So the fact that we are very simple to manufacture, and, and by the way, we bits has had uh, a very, very clear directive from the beginning. And, you know, I, I can talk about my board of directors and management team, but we have a very, very experienced team. And, you know, the clear directive from day one was you need to make the absolute best rear end possible, which is commercially viable. And that's something that most people forget that in me, you know, so we have been focused on using standard materials, standard tools, we can go to any fab in the world and basically go to the existing manufacturing line and with just a few tweaks, we can make it work and, and start manufacturing there. If you think about the fact that these lines cost billions of dollars to set up, 
you know, you can imagine what happens if you come with something that's non-standard or, or special or whatever. So Webit has a huge advantage that it's very easy for us to go to a new fab and, and go in, uh, again, with the adoptions and whatever, and, you know, in semiconductors, even the, the qu simplest things take a few months and whatever, but it's very easy, very quick, and the manufacturing process itself, while there's a lot of smarts that go into the technology, the manufacturing of the technology is very simple. And I mean, without going, well, you can go into a bit more depth, but I can imagine in an industry like this, research and development is is pretty much paramount because as you said, it's constantly being refined, it's constantly being improved. How is Webit Nano consistently putting effort into the research and development to keep refining the, the processes and stay ahead of, of competitors? So Webit is is very, very, very focused on R&D. Uh, you know, today... If I include the complete team that's working on this project, employees and contractors, we're about 50 people. Out of those, uh, 40 are in R&D. Uh, you know, we have 12 PhDs in R&D, just to give you a feel for, yeah. for that. And, and even the people that are in marketing or sales or other activities are engineers. You know, even I'm an engineer and, and the marketing guys, they're very technical and, and you know, they, they help a lot on that. So... Um, you know, we've been uh, very focused on the R&D work. Uh, this is a good time to mention our R&D partner. You know, obviously, you need a fab in order to develop a technology like WeBits. We can't afford a fab, and we're very lucky that the French government set up a facility called Leti with state-of-the-art fab uh, services for R&D. And we're working with them. They have a lot of experience in memory. They've been doing memory uh, research for more than 20 years already. And then we're working with them uh, to develop this technology. And, uh, you know, thanks to them, we managed to really get things going uh, faster than normal. You know, we're basically seven years of R&D, and we're already at the point of transferring the technology to mass production facilities, which... Um, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty much a world record, uh, uh, because, thanks to, you know, us working with Letty. Yeah. Partnering effectively to then, yeah, as you said, there's no real commercial value in yourselves building a, one of these state of the art facilities. And, and if you can go in and you have a, a standardized way of making it with advantages, it just makes it commercially such a better investment as opposed to investing billions of dollars in, into building it. And when you're talking about the, the commercialization and increasing manufacturing, what sort of objectives are there in regards to building up strategic partners to then go and purchase and, and utilize these, these chips that you're making? Well, you know, it's, th there are, first of all, there are two business models when you're working in this space. One is the very simple one. You just go and make memory chips and you sell memory chips and that's it. You know, we call that the discrete model or the standalone memory model. Uh, the other is the embedded model where, you know, as I was saying earlier, you have a system on a chip and a company is developing a whole product that it'll put on that chip and part of it needs to be memory. So the memory is embedded into that chip. Now, in that case, Weepit is not the one who's developing the product. It's actually the product company. Mm. So, you know, you, you need to have this IP licensing model where we license the technology to them so that they can work on it. Now, obviously, they need to manufacture it and they need to have a fab that would be able to manufacture it. So you end up having what I call this golden triangle where there's WeBit who's providing the technology. We license it to the fab so that the fab can manufacture it. We give them a manufacturing license. And then we license it to the product company so that they embed it into their SOC uh, system on a chip. And they can then go to the foundry and manufacture there. So we need to all work together. Uh, Webit is now very focused on, on the one hand, working with the biggest uh, foundries in the world so that they would adopt the technology in the... Uh, and, and put it in their fabs. They offer it to the customers. On the other hand, we are already working with quite a few of the product companies and, and trying to get them to start designing us into their chips and 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of, you always have this chicken and the egg situation where yeah. the fan comes and says, oh, great technology, but hey, even even those little tweaks and whatever, that's going to cost a lot of money. Where's the customer? Where's the revenue that it's going to come from? And you talk to the co the product company and say, oh, neat, you know, we really want to use this technology, but where are we going to manufacture? So in the, the early stages where Rebit is now, there's just a huge yeah. amount of effort into starting to get this going. Once the ball is rolling, it's rolling. You know, then you start going and, you know, you have more and more foundries using it and you have more yeah. product companies and they already know that there's a foundry to work with, et cetera. But getting those initial steps going is is extremely hard. Uh, everything here is is very costly. The risk levels for the foundries, for the product companies are very high. And so we need to really work with them to overcome their very legitimate concerns from a new technology. And this might be, again, jumping outside of the aspect of, of running a company, but I can imagine this is extremely stressful. And I've been wanting to get an insight into just a, a CEO and yourself. Hopefully you've got some techniques to managing stress because I don't quite think people understand just the demand and the stresses that you go through on an, on an every day. So how do you, how do you manage all this noise, the stresses, the deadlines and, and, and yeah, how, how do you manage it? Well, you're absolutely right. It is extremely stressful. Uh, I guess the first thing is when you see the white hair, well, they, in the podcast, they won't see that, <laughs> right yet, but you know, it's, it's just a matter of experience. You know, yeah. I've been through this for so long. I've been in startups. I, I was CEO of a startup before. It's you just learn how to focus and not take these things and, and lose control because of them. So that's the key thing. First of all, just need to uh, you know, not get excited about everything that's happening. The second most important thing is to hire the best possible team so that they share with you. You know, they, they say that CEO is the loneliest job in the world, and it absolutely is. You're all alone there. Mm. trying to deal with all of this uh, stress and every decision can can really make the company, you know, two levels up or take the company two levels up or two levels down. And having a very strong team of experts that work with you, that work very well together without politics in the team, that's critical. I, if, if there's anything that I'm proud of is that over the years I've learned to build teams of experts and, and the team that we have in WeBit is phenomenal. It's, it's really, um, yeah, I've, I've known the VPs, uh, I've, I've known them for many, many years before WeBit. Uh, I handpicked them, uh, for their jobs. Uh, and, and I know they work together well, you know, that, actually last week when I was in Australia, someone was asking me and I realized that the average age of my VPs is something like 55, which uh, again, it shows you the level of experience and yeah. knowledge and the, the stress level is insane. And, uh, you know, you have customers that you're building on and you're saying, wow, you know, we're really going to have this amazing deal. And then suddenly they come out with something that's even irrelevant to weep it. And yeah. oh, you know, the, the company now is in a bad financial situation. We're going to have to put everything on hold for a few months. And what do you mean? Put a thing yeah, on exactly. Hold? And then you're just expected to I, deal I took, with I it. I told the market, I want to have a customer, you know, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, by this date or that, or I want to have this deal, or, you know, we want to move forward. We don't want to wait and, and stuff. Yeah. And, and you have all of these surprises constantly happening, constantly happening. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's what I love. I, I mean, the thing that I really love about working in the smaller companies is these challenges, is the, the satisfaction when you overcome the challenges and when you achieve the next step and you move forward. And I look back and I say, wow, you know, I joined WeBit when the market cap was $11 million and we were just three guys down in a basement. And, and look at what we've done. You know, it's so amazing. And, and that's what gives you the energy to deal with all of this. Yeah, it's having that 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 experienced team because again, you try it together, and it's like a, a, at the end of the day, you know, the CEO is, is at the top of the chain, but if you've got a team that supports you, you'll have a, a confirmed and and deadline and a straight direction. As you more mentioned before about Weebit, having that strategy, it does make it a bit easier. But yeah, sitting here, it's very easy for me to say, I, I, again, I, I really I envy and and impressed by a lot of like yourself how you manage these stresses. Um, 
And when you're looking to, to the future and, and this year, you know, we're rapidly going through 2023, but on the horizon for Webit Nano, what do you see are the real key timelines and objectives to hit for, for this financial year and onto, onto the future of semiconductors? Uh, this year is, is uh, you know, every year you think that that year is, is the special one and the one that's really changing things. But this one is really the year when we move from, you know, the, the R&D phase into a, a real commercial phase. We already have one commercial agreement with Skywater and we have been moving forward and we're already talking to Skywater customers. But I think the key thing about this year will be that, you know, our plans are to, to start having agreements with the tier one fabs, uh, to start having customer agreements. Uh, I'm even expecting, you know, some small, not, not huge things, but some small level of revenues to start trickling in. Um, so it's, uh, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. I think this year will be a transformation year where we, we start building the sales team. Uh, we already hired one sales guy in the U.S. We'll need to expand. We have a rep in, in Korea and we have uh, our guy in, in Hong Kong, which originally, you know, he was focused on China. Now I'm, you know, he's helping in all kinds of things. Uh, but we really will be building a, a stronger sales activity. The marketing team, uh, we're now going uh, uh, you know, last year we started going to trade shows. This year we'll be going to much more. We just came back last week. I was in Australia, but the team was at Embedded World, which is a huge conference. And and so we're going to be working very hard on building the Webit brand, getting the name out there, uh, getting the the big foundries involved, and maybe you know, uh, in a in a short summary, we have a unique opportunity this year. The, the rear end market really suddenly exists. It's, it's a market that a year ago, a year and a half ago, when I would talk to people about, they would say, that's that future thing, right? You know, it's yeah. very neat technology and everything. It's a future thing. It is, it is here. Now. It is now. Customers are asking, the product companies are asking the foundries for rear end. Uh, the foundries are looking for rear end solutions, you know, the, except for TSMC that has something and, you know, little things here and there in, in maybe one or two other uh, foundries. The, the reality is that most of them are looking for a strong solution. And, and right now, WeBit is, I, I strongly believe, the leading uh, independent, let's call it, rear end solution. Uh, we're talking to the majority of the tier one fabs. There's a huge vacuum out there. There's a huge vacuum. We bit, you know, my goal is to try to fill as much of that vacuum as I can before something else shows up. And obviously something will show up that uh, nature doesn't support vacuum. There, there's always something that fills the vacuum. So I just want to take as much as I can, as fast as I can. And this year is going to be it. Yeah, what well, sounds like an insane transition for, for the company. And, and you can always look back and say that was a good year, but each year, sounds like it's just going to get better and better. And I mean, from looking from around the world at all the semiconductors and, and the need for all these, these, these chips in particular, there is, there's this huge opportunity waiting to be, to be tapped. So I look forward in particular to seeing how Webit Nano goes this year. Uh, and I think your insights into this whole industry is, is exponential and, and so valuable. So thank you so much, Kobe, for joining me on the show today. And um, if people want to learn more about Webit Nano and get in contact and follow the the story and the the successes, where can they go? Well, we actually put a lot of stuff on the website. We, we have, first of all, I know that people in Australia don't, don't always know semiconductors and what it means. So we have a very elaborate glossary and if things are missing there, let us know. But we really put a lot of stuff in the glossary there. We have a lot of blogs and white papers. And I think that's the best way to turn to. And uh, I think my shareholders already know I'm, I'm very accessible. They can always uh, send uh, queries. Uh, you know, we, we really try to respond and explain as much as we can. Fantastic. Well, I know that there's the website and yeah, you're listed on the ASX and announcements come out there and you're all across the social. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. And I look forward to touching base later in the year and seeing how the reround market is, is accelerating and all the new opportunities and advancements in that area. So thank you for joining me today on the show. 
for the same thing for having me. Thanks for listening to the Markable Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to like and subscribe. You can follow the Market Bull on our socials at Twitter and LinkedIn by searching the Market Bull. You can also subscribe to our newsletter on the website by visiting www.themarketbull.com.au.